Hey, good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Welcome back to Open Mics with Dr. Stites. If you take a drive through rural Kansas, you start to understand there are hundreds of small towns that can feel a little isolated. That isolation isn't a bad thing. It's part of the appeal of rural life to many people. But it is a huge obstacle in healthcare. Rural patients often have to drive hours for basic medical care, not to mention specialized care. In some Kansas counties, there are literally no doctors who can deliver a baby. Patients in rural America still deserve and should have high quality care. Today we're going to explore what's being done to help deliver that care in our state. Joining me today, we have experts who have spent decades working directly with patients in rural Kansas. Jody Smith is the Executive Director of the Care Collaborative, which is a real success story for improving outcomes in rural settings. She's also a former CEO of a rural hospital. We're having a fun time talking to Jody. Dr. Michael Kennedy is a family medicine doctor who I've known, who is was the institutional memory at this place until he retired. <laughs> now he's the, he was a former associate dean for rural health education at the University of Kansas Medical Center School of Medicine. Now I think he's a world traveler. Dr. Bob Mosher is the executive director of the Kansas Center for Rural Health and the Dean of the University of Kansas School of Medicine's Salina campus. He was also formerly the Secretary of Health and Environment for the state of Kansas. These folks know a lot about rural care. Thanks everyone for being here. We're gonna have a little fun with this program. I've known all these folks for a while. That means I get to mess with them a little bit. <laughs> this is gonna be the best. Let's start by establishing, all right, how is healthcare different in a rural setting? Jody, I'm gonna start with you about that. Well, as you said, I was the CEO of a rural hospital for yeah. many years and have been working in rural health care here in Kansas for about 35. And it's an issue of delivering the same high quality care, but with fewer resources. It's just the reality that we face in rural communities. And also the distances that we have to go for that next level of care. So it really requires us to, to think through how we're going to manage patients, how we're going to care for patients, and really what are the strategies for addressing resources? How can we take advantage of federal programs to help? How do we develop partnerships that help us really bring high quality care to the rural community? So Dr. Moser, the state has a major role in trying to help improve the health of rural Kansans as well. Talk a little bit about some of the things the state has done historically and now to help address those deficiencies. Yeah, the, the state's been a great partner with the University of Kansas uh, School of Medicine uh, and uh, the college. They've, uh, for the last got to think about this, 70 years, uh, you know, with the Murphy Plan that came out in the 50s, um, you know, moving students out into the rural setting to get exposure to what uh, the practice of medicine was like um, was a, a great um, milestone to start moving uh, the interest of students toward that rural setting. Um, and then back in the late uh, 70s, creating the Kansas Medical Student Loan Program to uh, help offset the cost of medical education, which is a big uh, hurdle for a lot of students that uh, look at health uh, as a career and that's been very successful and then even in the 90s uh, creating uh, the rural scholars program looking at how could we identify students from rural communities with an interest in uh, medicine and uh, get them in on an early pathway toward admission to medical school as sophomores in college and that also has been a great success story and then finally um, Back in 2011, we uh, expanded the four-year medical campus to Wichita and to Salina in addition to Kansas City so that we could increase enrollment um, and out of that hopefully continue to attract students with an interest in primary care and uh, hopefully uh, to stay in Kansas practice in rural. So all of those have been great success stories. So uh, University of Kansas uh, Medical Center's definitely been a great partner right along with the state in, in moving forward with uh, the programs we need to attract those types of students. It's a pretty darn big deal. And, and Dr. Kennedy, I teach you about being the institutional memory. It is true. Actually, I think maybe the both of us could yeah. be qualified <laughs> to that one now. But you've worked in these rural things for trying to get more students out into the, the, the rural aspects of the state. How successful were those, well, what were some of the things you did? And, and how successful were those programs? Um, we did a lot of things, right? Uh, one of the first things that um, I did when we, um, when I started as the Dean for Rural Health at the 
uh, School of Medicine was to open an office for rural health education. And, um, and through that office, we um, gelled up uh, many programs that were kind of dispersed uh, and in various departments throughout the university. And so we, uh, we started to pull those together and then look at kind of the gap analysis and where were the opportunities. And so we looked at um, things like, um, was there a place for students to do clinical experiences in their first two years of medical school? And, um, and there was a small program with just a few students in it. Um, we expanded that to uh, 40 um, students at its peak where the students went out for the summer um, between their first and second year and did a rural experience with uh, in a small town. Um, extraordinarily successful. The students came back with the wow factor, right? And it really charged them up for their second year. And then we adopted the model rural by choice. And do you have the right stuff to practice in a rural setting? And so, so much of it is establishing that skill set and then um, giving the students the tools to be successful at, um, at a rural practice. And um, through that then, we um, continued to expand the various programs and we went from 400, we measured it in student weeks, one week of a rural experience for one student. And um, we went from 400 student weeks um, per year to over 1,000 student weeks per year. Yeah, it's so darn exciting. You guys have done such great work over the years, and the health system's done some pretty cool stuff, too. Jody, talk to us a little bit about what this CARE Collaborative is. Sure. The CARE Collaborative was launched in 2014 through a CMS Innovation Award, where they've provided us funding to really demonstrate how could we take the expertise of our academic medical center out into the rural communities to both improve quality and reduce total cost of care. So we do that through what we call our boot camps, where we we actually, Dr. Mosier and our team go out into a rural community. They share the same type of protocols that we use here at the Academic Medical Center that our providers help develop, but they're made to fit a rural environment and the resources that fit a rural environment. But in that way, we're able to train all of the physicians, the nurse practitioners and PAs, the nurses, EMS, all of the team around the evidence and the research at the same time. So what we've really found is that when we can do that and then follow that up with protocols and checklists and recommendations and resources, that we can really move the needle in showing that rural healthcare can achieve those same quality benchmarks that we look for here at the Academic Medical Center. And so we really spend time boots on the ground working in the rural communities to assist them with the tremendous resources we have here. So Bob, you've spent a lot of time working in the Care Collaborative and helping develop it as well. Talk to us, Dr. Mosier, a little bit about some of the things that have been successful about it and some of the challenges it's faced. Yeah, it uh, was exciting to get involved with that. Uh, coming from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, uh, we knew you know, that we had higher mortality rates for heart attack and stroke victims in rural Kansas. And so as we went out and helped our rural practices develop their protocols for managing those patients, and we started collecting the data to look at it. I think one of the most impressive things was how quickly our rural practices adopted those protocols. I mean, within the first three months, we were seeing significant improvements in all of the time measures we were looking at. And then what was even more exciting was as we finished up that first year, we saw where in the past, less than 3% of patients with an ischemic stroke were getting a clot-busting drugs uh, delivered to them if they were eligible. And uh, we quickly were over the national benchmark goal of 20%. And that's all of the great work uh, at the local level that those providers uh, tackled and adopted those uh, processes and protocols to be successful. So to see them, to know that we can bring that type of uh, information and expertise and help them to adapt it to their local realities and to see them be successful uh, was really truly a, a great experience and, and remains one. That's a really big deal and, and I would guess, Dr. Kennedy, that as you look at that thing, the things that Care Collaborative have done, that probably has been a great educational tool as well. Oh, absolutely. And you know, uh, having students go to these practices and see the kind of care that can be given and uh, in, in some of the most remote places. 
some of these towns were less than a thousand, and they can they can see um, how well these doctors perform um, in not only trauma situations. What's that's anxiety provoking, right? And so the students get to see um, how that can be done um, expertly. They get to see the, the established network um, that these docs can practice in, that they have ready access to um, uh, you know, co more collaborative care and decision making for emergency medicine as well as um, those specialty cases that need referral. So the students come back and go, yeah, this is doable. I mean, I'm not practicing in isolation. And, you know, and, and hats off to the rural docs who then accept these students, who then um, also you know, accept new um, policy and practice guidelines. Because I, I think one of the things, one of the beauties of rural practice is, you know, they have the flexibility. Um, you can adopt new things rather quickly um, in your practice. If you're in a large academic medical center, um, good luck making changes in your, in your practice guidelines or your day-to-day -day practice. It's obviously got to go to committee. When the committee is a committee of one or two, then the decision making is really streamlined and they can adopt these, um, they can be early adopters for a lot of this stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. And, and unfortunately, it does take money to run it. And uh, we know that it's always a question. We know that the state recently gave the Care Collaborative, Jody, a $1.1 $1 .1 million grant. Talk to us a little bit about that. What does that mean? Sure, we're very excited about this new grant from uh, the state to really help us look at a new program that is available to rural hospitals that are struggling. The uh, Rural Emergency Hospital Program is a big decision for a rural community because to participate in that, you're keeping your emergency room, you're keeping your outpatient services, but you're giving up inpatient care. That's a tough decision to make, but when you're facing challenges of potential hospital closure, and we are seeing rural hospitals close all around the country and here in Kansas, then you've really got to to figure out what makes sense for our community. And that's part of the money that we will be using this for to really help communities make good decisions, really explore what patient needs are being met currently, what are services that they could continue to expand upon, how would they coordinate care in their emergency room if they didn't have inpatient care, what does that mean operationally and financially and clinically as they consider such a transition. So uh, in addition to that, we're adding some remote patient monitoring for Medicaid patients. It's something that we piloted during the pandemic with high-risk Medicare patients that we were concerned about during COVID. But this is the opportunity now to expand that and take it out to Medicaid patients with chronic conditions who really could benefit from monitoring between their physician visits. Very excited about the potential to really help rural facilities access some of these leading-edge new programs. You know, that's a really impressive story, and I think the grant was great. I uh, also should, we should also talk about the Patterson Family Foundation, which recently gave a $2 million grant to the Care Collaborative. We talked with the president of the Patterson Family Foundation. 20% of the population lives in a rural community, but only 7% of the philanthropic dollars are invested back within rural communities. And knowing that the private market doesn't make as much sense when there's depopulation and sparse geography and disparate geography areas, um, it, it, it puts a big role of philanthropy and a big opportunity of philanthropy to step in and fill some of those gaps. So, you know, we know there are a lot of obstacles and a lot of disparities uh, there. How much, Dr. Roger, you're putting on your KDHE hat plus your dean hat <laughs> for just a moment. How much is funding the issue to fix these, the, these challenges? Well, uh, Dr. Steich, yeah, great. I, I do want to mention uh, briefly that uh, I stepped down as dean in January so I could focus on getting our Kansas Center for Rural Health uh, established. And fortunately, we had Dr. Tyler Hughes, a general surgeon, yep, yep. who's Step into yeah, who yep. stepped into that role. I, think I did know that, but you see, when you get older, your institutional memory fails <laughs> from time to time. I asked Kennedy about that. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> but yeah, but no, funding uh, truly uh, is a challenge. Um, 
You know, and, and policy toward rural health care has always been kind of uh, viewed as, well, it's cheaper to live in a rural setting, so we don't need to reimburse as much and the cost is less. And we know that's not true. But, um, you know, Jody and, and the Care Collaborative, and myself and others, uh, we've taken uh, a lot of the grants and the philanthropy donations, and we look at it as venture capital, if, if you would. If we can take that and we can develop a program where we can show it a, as a successful model and develop a business model that's sustainable, then it's a great investment. Um, but funding is often kind of a barrier, and that's kind of where we're at, if you would, as we start with our Kansas Center for Rural Health. There's a lot of yeah. activities and programs that we would like to work with our rural communities on evaluating and investigating, but there's never a grant that just perfectly exists out there that fits the definition. So, you know, the center wouldn't have gotten started without also contributions from the Patterson Family Foundation. So, um, those those funding mechanisms everything. are key. They it make means everything. everything. Yes. And, and, and there's so much to be done. One of the chances I would think, and, and I'm just making this up so you guys can beat me up about this. <laughs> do you have a hard time, as I, I know we do, uh, great, but do you have a hard time recruiting physicians and providers into really small towns and rural settings. And how do we overcome that challenge? It's it's tough, yeah. It's, it's been kind of a, an age-old problem, right? As uh, Dr. Mosier mentioned, 70 years ago, um, the dean at the time, Murphy, uh, came up with the Kansas plan, and the whole idea was to put incentives out there to attract physicians um, mostly young starting out physicians to rural places. Um, that continues a lot of the um, a lot of the pressures are still there um, in terms of you know uh, having a small town serve as a viable place to educate your children, um, to have a place for your spouse to work, to have um, adequate. Um, uh, commerce and locally um, to provide those shopping opportunities um, and some of those things then are not things that we can fix but I think we can attract those I mentioned rural by choice and that was really kind of the theme behind many of our programs was we're not going to trap the kids who grow up in rural towns who don't want to stay um, many are looking for a path out um, there are an extraordinary number that I think we were missing initially that are, are looking for a way, how can I have a career in my hometown? How can I have a career in a small town? But then there's an option, although not as many, but there's urban folks who are like, you know, I'm sick of the city. How can I get out of the rat race? I, I love this idea of, you know, an opportunity to work and live and raise my children in a small town. And so how can I do that? I think, you know, the, the other really um, visible things about a small town is that sense of village, you know, to, to raise my kids, for me to live and work. All the social support systems, the social capital has been the term used to describe that. All of those things are in place, but I think a lot of it is stuff that students are not aware of uh, right at the front. They have to you know, be shown that path, and so that's where a lot of those programs exist is we can finance your way through medical school, we can help you in the first years of your practice um, by loan relief, we can um, show you that support systems are available from the campus where you did your education, Solano, Wichita, and Kansas City. Um, and so I think those are the things that will ultimately help attract um, you know, young physicians to join practices in, in rural towns. We're seeing more and more, I, I did a workforce study several years ago and it was gloom and doom, right? It it's, was looking it is, pretty bad. It is tough. So. Um, I think we've turned the corner slightly, Yeah. Uh, but we still need a lot of, a lot of new recruits. So Jody, you know, I think about this landscape. You mentioned rural hospitals closing, and I know it's been predicted 20 to 40 percent of rural hospitals could close in the next few years or next mm -hmm. 10 years, whatever, and, 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 and you think, how are we going to reach the patients? Telemedicine looks like it's going to play a bigger role. 
What are you seeing as the impact of telemedicine in small towns in Kansas? Telemedicine in small towns in Kansas is huge. I can tell you just this week we have a teleendocrinology clinic that is double booked because the need is so great and they had been without endocrinology services for more than a decade in that particular community. So it really is the way to bridge that gap and really make distances disappear in terms of how we're able to connect those patients to specialists and subspecialists. And at the same time, some of the new technologies allow us to connect with patients in their home. And so for a patient with long COVID, we can now measure their O2 from their home through remote patient monitoring. So it's really um, amazing the new capabilities. There's a new grant around nursing home at home. Uh, really exciting new developments in terms of what we're able to do and how we're able to connect patients across distances as a result of the continued focus on improving broadband in rural areas across the mm -hmm. state and in the exciting new technologies and more physicians and providers willing to engage with technology. You know, my, here's my suspicion, and, and Bob, I'll be good to get your impact or your thoughts about this. But, you know, I, so this weekend I went on a long bike ride with my son, and then they were looking at the stats, and I was going through it. You, you get everything your heart right here, your heart right there, how many pedal, blah, blah, blah. And so much information coming off the old watch, right? Yeah. Right, young watch, I guess. <laughs> and so, but I, you look at this and I think, wow, we can do so much in rural settings now with some of the technology, and that technology is only going to get better. I think one of the best ways to get access is to get better tech. I, I certainly agree with you, and uh, you know, we've seen that since we've started with some of the remote patient monitoring. Uh, the equipment's improving continually. As we look at how uh, artificial intelligence takes some of that information, distills out the key features for you so that you don't get lost in the forest because of the trees, so to speak. And so, um, I think technology is going to be some of the answer for rural health care access and uh, the quality and uh, specialty of care uh, delivered in the rural setting because we really kind of fail to recognize, we talk about the cost of insurance and, and whatnot, but in the rural setting you, you have additional out-of-pocket costs just because of the travel, the time away from work, child care. It's, you know, it, it's just never necessarily brought to the forefront that that's also an issue that technology can help reduce. I think technology is going to be huge both in urban and rural settings and I look forward to its broader application as we get yeah. better at it and we get smarter at it. Yeah. Well you know I bet there's some questions that are looming out there. Please send us your questions. They're going to be right there on your screen. You can send them using the links to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter or email the Medical News Network. But first before we go to Jill Chadwick in studio about questions we're going to go to Doc Hawk for the COVID count. Hi. Yeah, right now for the COVID count, uh, we're doing a lot better, Steve. We have been this past week. So 16 total, but only three active, none in the ICU, and none on the ventilator. I love it. Yeah. It's back down to where we were mm -hmm. last spring, about two, about six, eight weeks delayed. Um, but I, it still feels good to be down to those levels. How long are we going to stay there, Doc? I'm hoping that we will stay there for the, the vast majority of this warm summer season. Uh, even before we move into uh, the fall. So uh, like we, we've talked about a little bit, this may be coming more of a seasonal respiratory virus, but we still know there's probably gonna be more circulating virus than say other respiratory viruses like influenza, other common cough and cold coronaviruses, but hopefully getting into more of a seasonality. So the World Health Organization this last weekend, or last week, talked a little bit about their growing concern about the XBB um, variant, yeah. which is part of the lineage mm -hmm. from Omicron. Yeah. But they even went so far as to say, you know, maybe we need a more of a monovalent vaccine because the current bivalent doesn't look all that great against XBB. Talk to us. Yeah, I think we are maybe looking at that. Um, we know that we've made some changes to our availability of the original monovalent here in the United States that is no longer available. We are using the bivalent, uh, which has one of the original spikes, but then also an Omicron lineage as well. Um, I think it's reasonable. Um, it will be somewhat hard to tell because we know there can be those shifts in the spike protein, um, but all of the variants that we've seen recently um, have all been from the Omicron lineage, uh, sub-lineages. 
And so I think maybe trying to tailor a vaccine with an antibody immune response is certainly reasonable. We still have all of those conserved T cell regions, which we have seen throughout all the variants, which are very good. There, aren't, there haven't been any wholesale changes to the virus itself as far as leading to more severe or different disease. So that is always good as well. And so I think that's good. And I think with the mRNA technology, we do have that avail availability to pivot. Um, and we'll just kind of ultimately see what does come from the vaccine companies and what is approved or recommended by the FDA and CDC. Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a big deal out there. And, you know, I don't think I worry too much about whether it's a monovalent or the bivalent. I just mm -hmm. want it to be the right valent. And <laughs> if we get the right valent, then we're, then we're good. Yeah, and just like you've said as well, it, the muddy, the waters get so muddy now because people have had previous vaccines. They've had infection or reinfection. You know, we know you get those immune boosts from either a booster dose of vaccine or the actual infection as well. And so that's really muddied the waters and created different types and levels of overall immunity. What we are trying to do with the vaccines uh, and what natural infection does as well is really help protect against hospitalization and severe disease should you become infected or become infected again. And I think, you know, and every now and then we'll hit that conversation. Well, gosh, you guys used to push vaccination so much. It sounds like you're backing yeah. off. You're admitting that natural immunity is better. Like, no, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. The difference is that Initially, COVID was really bad. Yeah. And now it's back down a little bit mm -hmm. and vaccination works. Yeah. And we have Paxlovid oral therapy and we have good therapy with remdesivir and other techniques in the hospital. So our numbers are better. So I, I, I think you just have to watch it as a story of progression. And now what we're looking at is what is it gonna be like on an annual basis and what happens if one of these um, variants gets worse. One of the things that I think is true, Hawk, comment on this, COVID overall has the potential to become far more dangerous if it, if it evolves a certain direction mm -hmm. than say influenza does. Yeah. That spike protein can be really dangerous. Yeah, and that's what really a lot of the uh, experts that have been put together to maybe model if there's a potential for a large worldwide surge. Uh, that is truly what they have uh, concerns with is, is there can, can there be some other wholesale changes to the virus aiding to e actually increase virulence or escaping our immune systems, um, our T cells, and our antibodies as well. So I think you're exactly right with that. Um, it is still affecting other parts of the world as well. So I think we have to be aware of that. I heard the other day that there's still a third of the world that hasn't ever had a vaccine dose as well. So so it is, it is impactful in different parts of the world. Certainly for most people in the United States, it doesn't impact their daily lives. But even in the United States, there are those uh, certain populations that it can be very impactful as well. All right, I bet there's gonna be some community questions out there. Jill Chadwick, <laughs> welcome back to the chair today. Thank you, good morning. Bruce wants to know, talking about COVID, have there been any lasting impacts from COVID on rural communities in the hospitals? Oh, that is a great question. Joe, do you wanna start with that? There absolutely has been some lasting impacts. During the pandemic, rural hospitals were holding on to patients for long periods of time, waiting for a bed to open up for them to be able to transfer. And so they certainly stepped up to the plate and did uh, tremendous work managing those patients as best they could. But it certainly put stressors on the workforce. And so as we're coming out of the pandemic, workforce shortages are the number one concern I hear from rural hospitals. CEOs and CNOs day in and day out, uh, a real challenge there. And then as we talked before, um, coming out of COVID, during COVID there were some financial um, uh, uh, dollars flowing to them to support the pandemic that have gone away. And so now those, those financial challenges that existed prior to the pandemic are coming back and hitting facilities even harder than they did before. Plus with sl supply chain shortages, all of those things are more expensive. So costs are rising um, and workforce shortages are, are preventing them from taking care of some of the patients they may have previously. It is a really difficult situation for rural hospitals today. And roughly half of our rural hospitals are operating at a loss today. Yeah, which is not gonna be sustainable in the long run and one of our biggest challenges. So I love that program, you know, as you talked about the CARE Collaborative National Program a little bit ago about, well, you may not have inpatient beds, which that means a census of one or two, but you're gonna have a strong emergency room and a strong urgent care clinic, which is probably more viable anyway in the long run. 
It is. It, it takes the right um, development of services to make sure that you can appropriately manage that patient who comes into the emergency room, which is why our work as a collaborative becomes even more important and why the ability to support providers in the rural community becomes even more important. But then day in and day out, patients with COPD and diabetes and hypertension, they need ongoing outpatient services. They need physical therapy. They need uh, pulmonary rehab and cardiac rehab and a host of imaging support in order for them to stay local and get their care local. And so those are the services that through this program we can help them beef up. And so as you said, they may be giving up one or two inpatients day in and day out, but what we're able to do is then help them take those added federal dollars and expand some of the services that their community really needs in order to improve health care. It's going to be, I, th I think that's going to be a big development. I think telemedicine is going to aid that so much. Jill. Absolutely. Joellen wants to know, a very thoughtful question. Are there any programs for high school students to introduce them to the rural care health fields like summer internships and those kind of oh, things? Oh, I, I see <laughs> both Dr. Mosier and Dr. Kennedy shaking their heads. Dr. Mosier, I'm going to ask you to start. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start and try not to take uh, too much time. But yeah, there are a number uh, of things. You like and, to talk about this. Today. Yeah, and what we you know have been uh, doing as a care collaborative when we go out and do our boot camps with the local health system, so I always like to ask, you know, what are you doing at the local level to develop the workforce you know that you need for your healthcare <coughs> system uh, and it varies I mean there's some really great innovative programs from just simple work study where the high school student gets to come in and shadow the provider the lab tech the administrator whatever that may be uh, but um, here uh, at the University of Kansas Medical Center uh, the Institute for Community Engagement has been uh, supporting and developing more HOSA programs which are kind of the health occupations student associations um, at the high school level uh, and so they're supporting that type of early health career exposure and shadowing opportunities and so I would say you know look at the local level look at your school uh, but recognize that hey reach out to any of our campuses uh, as a matter of fact we created a rural health council uh, here at the KUMC uh, to look at how we could support all of the various workforce and pipeline uh, activities that are taking place and so uh, uh, reach out to the Kansas Center for Rural Health and at our Salina campus. We'll plug you in and, <laughs> and help you find out what's available in your area. I think that's a, that's such a big deal. You know, we got two family medicine doctors. They're both family medicine physicians, and it feels like that's such an important role in small communities, Dr. Kennedy. It is. Uh, it can't be done any other way, really. I mean, because it's just not... Um, you're not able to sustain your practice financially if you can't diversify the kinds of patients that you take care of. So while you can care for 95% of what walks in the front door, um, there's 5% um, that you need to refer out. But if you can't do that 95%, then financially you can't stay afloat. You know, I wanted to say too that there are several grassroots programs, um, they are calling themselves kind of health academies that uh, directly involve high school students. Now there's, you know, some regulations about minors in healthcare facilities and that kind of thing that um, need to be navigated. But, uh, but then a lot of the clinics that are some freestanding, some associated with the hospital, some even in the same building, but, uh, but separate um, in, from a financial standpoint. But those then have a little more flexibility. They can bring students in, they can have students um, you know, watch um, procedures, watch how um, care is delivered in, in their, kind of their hometowns. There's, it's a different kind of care. It's more personal care um, because, um, you know, if you live in a town of, I, I was in a practice of 2,800 people um, in my small town, you're in a town that size, you know everybody and you know their kids. And, um, and so it ends up being a very personal um, kind of practice. I think um, the students get to see that and that needs to start in high school and then um, develop from there. Got a big deal. Jill Chadwick, back to you. Cindy has a question that kind of speaks to what Dr. Kennedy was 
talking about. She wants you to clarify what you mean when you say there's no doctors in some communities to deliver babies, because don't you all deliver babies? Haven't you delivered a baby, Dr. Kennedy? Uh, well, that, that's a big one, but not everybody <laughs> in family medicine does, and not every community has the doctor. That's exactly right. Is that what right. you're clarifying? Yeah, exactly right. So if you exclude the, the urban counties in Kansas, that leaves 89 um, non-urban counties Out of in 105, Kansas. 105. Out of 105. Out of 105. Yep. Yeah. So now that's you're at 89. <laughs> only, hey, good job. Only um, 44 of those counties actually provide um, OB services, maternity care. And, um, and then family medicine docs, while they all train um, to deliver babies, but then they get out and the environment's different, right? And so do you have the support systems in place to provide adequate obstetrical services? Because you need anesthesia on call. You need um, you know, a place where you can handle obstetrical emergencies, and so um, those aren't always readily available. And then, um, and then the other thing that you need um, that's critically important is the other staff in the hospital. So you need nurses who can do that, and you need all the other support systems in place. And so, that's not always the case. So we're down to 44 um, counties that can provide um, those maternity and OB services from 89. So it's less than half. Yeah. Family but doctors. But there's still uh, OB prenatal care occurring, but yeah. just not the deliveries. Yeah. Not yeah. deliveries. Because yeah. there's, and, and then you would think, well, um, the certified nurse midwives will do that. Well, they have the desire to. But the problem um, with certified nurse midwives is the same that it is with obstetricians, and that is unless you have a, a broad spectrum of care, um, then you're going to be sitting in your office twiddling your thumbs um, while you wait for those few patients. Your, your volume in some of those counties is less than 100 babies a year. And But the distance is immense, and, and there the it goes. And this is one place where telemedicine isn't always the answer, no. so no. Jill. Yeah. Okay, so Pat gets the last question. What is the difference between rural and frontier? Oh, there you go. Okay, who's going to handle that one? <laughs> All right, Mosier, you're the yeah. politician. Well, so. <laughs> it, it, it really depends on uh, the program and how you want to define it. But in most cases, uh, frontier uh, is based on population density of six people or less uh, per square mile. So. Um, you know, rural is, is typically uh, like 25 or, or less. So uh, it, there are a variety of programs that define rural in different ways. But when we think of rural uh, and versus frontier, we kind of think of population density. But I always like to add in, you know, what the, the age demographic mix looks like, but mm -hmm. also the distance to the next uh, metropolitan support uh, environment, uh, yeah. because uh, there's frontier and then there's isolated frontier. Absolutely. Oh boy, here we go. That's yeah. a good <laughs> Guys, you have had a great discussion and I am grateful that every one of you uh, uh, were able to be here today and talk a little bit about some things that are really important out in rural America. Rural Kansas is a representation of rural America and I think it's the same in almost every state, right? This story goes on and on unless it's like, uh, you know, really dead state, Rhode Island or what have you. Um, I'd love to hear your final thoughts before we go. And Dr. Mosier, first of all, thank you for your service to the state. Thank you for the service for years as a physician. Thank you for your service to the School of Medicine. And we're glad you worked back with working full time with the Claire, uh, Care Collaborative and the Center for Rural Health. So final thoughts from you. Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a lot of great innovation taking place in, in rural health care and in Kansas, and uh, they need support, you know, as we talked earlier, funding's a big part of that, and, and uh, they've been squeezed enough, and um, I think it needs to be recognized. You give them a little bit more flexibility, they'll innovate, they'll help address what some of the local needs are, but I think uh, some of that has to be done on a rural setting uh, in a regional manner. Um, and I think our academic institution here has been great at, at recognizing their role, their mission, and supporting a lot of the work that, that I've been able to be part of. Uh, and so I appreciate uh, their, their uh, contributions and dedication as well. Dr. Kennedy, just to say, long career in family medicine here at KU and an associate dean and all this great work in rural healthcare. Final thoughts today. 
So, uh, you know, I, I retired two years ago. Um, the only mm -hmm. reason that I felt uh, that I could even consider retirement was that there are some great people who were willing to take the reins. Um, there are some extraordinary things continuing to go on. Um, and not to mention the old guys like uh, Dr. <laughs> Mosier. But, um, but, but things are um, still progressing very well. And, you know, um, we are making inroads and we are getting new minds in on this problem and how to tackle the issues of the future. I, I feel like I left it in really great hands. Yeah, uh, that is true. And I think he just volunteered to sign you up for the AARP. You <laughs> probably know what I'm saying. I think so. Jody Schmidt, you've been all over the state, done great work, got things running there. Final thoughts. You know, we believe that rural patients deserve the same high quality care that you get here in Kansas City. And if there's anything we've learned in our years of the Care Collaborative is that working together, we can really make it happen. We can definitely bring the resources and partnering with the local physicians and the nurses and the support team, we really can demonstrate that here in Kansas, we can provide the highest quality care no matter where you live and no matter where you choose to work. Dr. Hawkeye. Yeah, I think just going back to our, our COVID numbers, um, kind of switching gears a little bit. And I think it's good that our numbers continue to decrease. We know it's still out there, but overall, hopefully it will continue to decrease and have less impact, uh, especially those vulnerable populations as we move through these nice summer months. I'm hoping and we hope we get to move so well. Here's my final yeah. thought. You know, I've been in medicine approximately a very long time. Not as long as perhaps <laughs> the two of you, but darn close. And, and here's what I know. You know, uh, COVID was an amazing story in so many levels, a very deadly story, but in so many levels it taught us so much. We went from very little telemedicine to amazing telemedicine. We started having to work with patients much more remotely than we'd ever done before. You put technology and you take that level of innovation and you put it together, I think we can solve a lot of challenges for those folks who don't have access to care both highly urbanized settings as well as in rural settings, as well as the mom who's got four, or the dad who's got four kids at home and can't, make, can't leave and can't get childcare to come to an appointment. I think this is an amazing opportunity for improving the health of rural Kansans, and I'm delighted to have had this program today to talk about so what some of the challenges are, what some of our strengths are, and what some of the future is uh, about to come. So once again, what we always say in this program, faith, hope, and science is a powerful combination. So thanks again to all of our guests. I do want to brag just a little bit on Dr. Mosier here. Just last week, he received a Career Achievement Award from the National Rural Healthcare Association, the Lewis Gorin Award for Outstanding Achievement in Rural Healthcare. So before we go, here's a little video that's a tribute to his career. I have known Dr. Mosier for about 35 years now. We started out together in the Kansas Academy of Family Physicians and that's where I uh, first met him as the representative from his district for Tribune, Kansas. He provided emergency services, hospital services, outpatient services, and obstetrical services. This man has lived the life of a rural individual, not just a doctor, a rural individual. And so he understands from the ground up the problems and disparities that occur in rural life. He really understands where they're coming from in terms of managing patients in the clinic, in the hospital, being a resource to the local community. The governor appointed him as uh, Secretary of Health and Environment. He helped to uh, privatize Kansas Medicaid, um, which has shown to be a cost saver, but also to increase access to care. Subsequently, they looked at access time to care for heart attack and stroke in rural Kansas. We saw that there were higher mortality rates uh, for rural Kansans if you had a heart attack or stroke, higher readmission rates, the Kansas Heart and Stroke Collaborative, which is now known as the Care Collaborative that the University of Kansas Health System helped start back in 2014, is basically taking out evidence-based guidelines and working with our rural providers and health systems to put those into the local realities. But of course people were wondering, why is the Academic Medical Center now coming out across the state? And Dr. Mosier was really able to build that bridge because he had trusting relationships with so many of the providers all across
across the state. And today, we have 81 members across 72 Kansas counties, roughly two-thirds of the state of Kansas. He wasn't done yet. The chancellor asked him to lead up a committee to really look into rural medical education. My goal was how could we produce more physicians looking to do primary care and, and to do that practice in a rural setting. Why not have a four-year branch campus in Wichita and a four-year branch campus in Salina? The School of Medicine took on that proposal. Highly successful. It's in its 13th year. The graduates are about three-quarters of them are in rural practices, so it's really served its purpose. What is the legacy of Bob Mosier for rural Kansas? As things play out, I think he will we'll have founded the future of rural medicine for the next century here in Kansas. He really has built an infrastructure that will continue for decades. I think Kansans should really take a, a look in, in those rural communities and they'll see folks that are uh, truly dedicated to the mission of providing good care and support uh, for better health in our rural communities. I, I think it's amazing work that is being accomplished and, and needs to be respected. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update. It's like brain surgery without an incision. Focused ultrasound is changing lives for patients with tremors. I'm Jessica Lovell. On the next Morning Medical Update, we explore the game-changing technique just approved for even more patients, Thursday at 8 a.m. I'm Alexis Del Cid on the next All Things Heart. I was 19 days old when I had my first heart procedure. Two decades later, she felt so great that she ignored major symptoms that something else was wrong with her heart. The surgery she needed and the medical team she's since dubbed the Dynamic Duo, Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.